Father of modern quartermaster corps, he held the post of quartermaster general for 42 years. He died, with his boots on, so to speak, in 1860. Rarely has one person stayed in the same position for such a long time or had a great effect on the history of modern logistics. General Jessup was born in Berkeley County, Virginia, on December 16, 1788, the son of a distinguished revolutionary officer. In 1808, at the age of 20, he was appointed a second lieutenant of the 7th Infantry. In the War of 1812, he was a major of the 19th Infantry at the age of 24. He was brevetted successively to lieutenant colonel and colonel for gallantry in action. He was wounded several times and finally taken prisoner when General Hull surrendered to the British at Detroit. He was appointed quartermaster general at the age of 30 during the presidency of Monroe. Soon after taking office, he promulgated a set of regulations for the quartermaster corps, and that is why we are interested in him this evening. He showed a remarkably clear grasp of the problems of military supply. In my humble opinion, he was way ahead of his time. Many of his concepts and ideas are still used in the military and industrial logistics today. After he had served 10 years as Quartermaster General, he was brevetted Major General for conspicuous and efficient service. The functions of the Quartermaster Department had been gradually enlarged to include all purchasing for the Army. He hit the ground running, so to speak. Just after his appointment in 1818, he wrote a letter to Secretary of War Calhoun to say that he knew his office was one of high responsibility. He went on to further say that he would have to build the new bureau up from the bottom. In doing so, Jessup wrote that he would need to introduce system into a department hitherto without arrangement, without organization. Here is what he did over the next four decades to make this happen. Jessup promulgated regular procedures that included each quartermaster officer at each supply depot around the country to submit monthly and quarterly reports to Washington. Washington would know what is in each location and how that was changing over time. To make this operational, he instructed his officers to use 37 standard paper forms. Stop right here and think about this. 1825 example of systematic management. 37 documents can control an army. And these reports were not just sent to headquarters and filed. Jessup had a team of officers studying these papers to manage the business of defense. If something was amiss or not clear after close scrutiny, the reports were sent back for correction. The quartermaster's shop was run to exacting standards in the 40-year run-up to the Civil War. This was extraordinary during a time when such thing was virtually unheard of in either American government or business. Although he is seldom recognized as such, Jessup ranks as a pioneer of systematic management. In addition to the creation of a 19th century management information system of awesome power, Jessup was a people person. He surrounded himself with a cadre of young, bright managers to execute his plans. In July of 1838, Congress passed new legislation which allowed for 30 commissioned quartermaster officers at the rank of captain or above. Of the original 30, nine would serve as senior quartermasters for the North in the Civil War. This gave the Union a great deal of continuity. The importance of the systems developed by Jessup is why Miller entitled his book on Montgomery Meigs, Second Only to Grant. With the software in place, thanks to Jessup's 37 forms, the stage was set for the technological wonder of the 19th century, the telegraph. In the next few minutes, I will make a great distinction between technology and information. Just to be clear, the technology was the telegraph, the software was the coded forms, and the information was the data about the levels and flows of stuff in depots. At this point, I am going to introduce one of the few original thoughts that I had in doing the research for this talk. While I believe the organization of what I am presenting tonight is original, 
All of the stories I have been relating have been gleaned from others. Okay, here it is. In the study of the American Civil War, we tend to focus in on technology. Who among us is not interested in the Spencer rifle, ironclads, or large-bore artillery? So, too, is the telegraph of interest to us. But the telegraph is in a class by itself. It is a processor of information. The former three items have but one function, to deliver fire on a target. The telegraph delivers information, the content of which can vary from the sonnets of Shakespeare to rifles lost to some Confederate raider. The main point I want to make in this lecture is that people do not notice the difference between technology and information. They are not the same. With all due respects to Marshall McLuhan, the medium, technology, is not the message, information. That would be like saying Saturday Night Live is television, or to use a logistical setting, the amount of depot stock sent to Washington was the telegraph. We all appreciate the employment of the telegraph, but fail to notice what the information allowed the user to do. For the first time in history, a war could be managed from great distance. It was not the telegraph per se, but the information singing in the wires that made it so. All of Jessup's careful design of an information system could now be in Meggs's hands in an instant. I want to stress could be, as not everything was transmitted by wire. In Jessup's early days, circa 1825, when he developed his system, it took days or weeks for the data to arrive in Washington. Now it could take minutes. For the first time, you could control a battle in real time. Although I could go into the detail about many of the forms plus the many informal telegraph messages and letters that were transmitted, let me focus on just three. First of these was the inventory folio. In its paper format, it was a spreadsheet with hundreds of columns printed on large sheets of folio paper. Each column represented an item handled by the quartermaster in the field. Examples of these columns were for forage, transportation items, camp clothing, and garrison equipage. The rows represented items which came into stock, the amount of goods that were stored in a location, and the items which were released from the facility. Remember, these reports were issued monthly. In its electronic form, these same sheets could be created in Louisville and reproduced in Washington, D.C., or any other location with a need to know. I do not know the extent that these forms were being transmitted electronically, but I have found numerous examples of where the information was wired. The Taylor book often mentions Perkins telegraphed Nashville to request supplies and to inquire where the ordered material was. Even more than the book, in her dissertation that was the basis for the book, we find footnote after footnote saying, Telegram, Simon Perkins too. The next form of interest is the bill of lading for each receipt or issue of a stock. The sending depot prepared in triplicate everything a unit of transportation was going to haul. If the unit was a wagon train, for example, one copy stayed in the shipping depot, one copy went with the wagon master, and one copy went to the receiving officer. If the goods were placed on the road, Washington could know what was moving in real time. This was critical if there was some disruption along the way, and in war there is always disruption. While the inventory information was a monthly report, the bills of lading were only sent by telegraph if necessary. But the key fact still remains. If Washington wanted the information, telegraph technology stood ready to supply. This is only a tad removed from the way we supply our armed forces today. This stands in stark contrast to the ways we fought wars before the Civil War. Could you imagine the Congress of 1778 getting Washington's bills of lading? 